total 100% commitment till death do us part. I mean, that's what I promised to do. And that's the way I was raised, and that's the way it was going to be. I'm Steve Aubrey. What's the secret to having a lifelong loving marriage? Coming up, we'll hear from a few couples married over 40 years who are making it work. But first, we'll meet a married couple with a story of love and sacrifice that you'll never forget. Thinking back about it, it Joe and Juana Eris Mendez have been married 34 years, but recent events have brought them closer together than ever. It all started when Joe's health began to fail. I've been uh, diabetic for a little bit over 20 years, and uh, I thought I had it pretty well under control by diet. And it wasn't until about four years ago that I started feeling run down, weak. When I finally went to the doctor, he told me I was having kidney failure. It wasn't until I really started feeling bad that uh, they said I would eventually have to have a kidney transplant. As I saw him getting weaker and weaker, I used to wonder just how long he would last. And I used to see him in pain, and I, sometimes I would, I would feel so bad and so helpless, not being able to do anything for him. But when the doctor said that there would, there would be a chance of a transplant and we would have to wait for a cadaver, which is a two-year two year wait, or more in some cases. So we saw some hope there. But um, then the doctor said that it would be wonderful if a family member could donate, a live member could donate, because then uh, the kidney would last longer. So the first thing to do was to go to his sister and his brother. And of course, neither one were compatible. And then the next thing to do was to go to our children. But somehow, when it came to the children, I thought, well, they're young, they're just starting their life. Being three months in recuperation, it'd take a lot away from their family. And I thought, well, why not me? Try me. Maybe I'll, I'll be lucky enough to, to be compatible. And there was a hope, but also there was an understanding that my not being his relative, it wouldn't be very likely. But when the doctor said that we were compatible, I was really, really excited because then it would, it would end here. The search would end here. In a very rare but life-giving coincidence, Juana was found to be a suitable kidney donor for her husband. From then on, Joe and Juana saw the hand of God at work in their lives. The Lord is telling us something. I mean, He has set everything up. I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed that, at how He has played a, a, a role, I mean, the main role in our life. He has set everything up so that it's unbelievable. The transplant surgery went better than expected. Joe and Juana were released early from the hospital to their home, where they're completing their recoveries. There was no doubt in my mind. The Lord was very much every step of the way. We've, I have felt very much cradled, nurtured, cared for, loved, surrounded by so many people and so many prayers. Yeah. And I think that's a key thing right there was prayers. Prayers from our, our friends, our relatives, our, our parishioners. I was told that I might regret it, and I have not. I have not. To see Joe gaining strength, to see him walking around the block, I mean, he wasn't able to do that. To see him eating as much as he's eating. <laughs> now we have to put him on a diet. <laughs> no, I would do it again. I would do it again, just to see him up again. We celebrated at the hospital our anniversary. Our 34th wedding anniversary. I guess when we said, you know, I would love you through what, in, in good and in bad, in sickness and in health, it's possible. Uh, I used to think, well, when I was young, I used to think, well, you know, you, you can love somebody when everything's going well, but what do you do? How do people love somebody that's in a wheelchair? How do people love someone that's so, you know, always in bed? And going through this experience has taught me a lot about you, you love the person, you don't love the situation, you don't love the condition, you love the person. Joe and Juana are a fine example of a mature, loving marriage. But like many couples, they struggled for years to enjoy the relationship they have today. When we got married, I really thought that it was going to be a Cinderella story. Um, you know, me and my white dress, I think I even designed it to look like Cinderella's. But I thought we were going to be happily ever after because we were so much in love. But 
the first baby came and it was wonderful. The second baby came and it was more work and it was more stress. By the time the third baby came, it was a lot of stress. Financial, time-wise, housework, chasing after the babies. And we grew apart. In the beginning, Joe used to come straight from work and straight to me. And by the time, by seven years, six, seven years, he'd come home six, seven at night. And in the beginning, I used to have the table ready and the house really pretty and the babies really dressed up in, in me too. Uh, by six, seven, eight years, um, if I took a shower in the morning, it was wonderful. If not, well, that's the way life goes. Uh, we were getting lonely, even living together. I was feeling lonely. I was feeling, I began to fill my, my days and my time with uh, piano lessons for the kids and sports and art, music, you name it. I had the kids in every possible program. So Joe used to come home and I used to get in the car and leave with the children to um, do whatever I had to do. Dinner would be in the oven, so I was fulfilling my, my part. What we were going through was uh, what we call now a spiritual divorce. And you because know, we knew we loved each other, but we just didn't know exactly to what extent anymore. I think we both had taken each other for granted. At that point, I was uh, seeing other things in more priority than, than her and the children. Joe and Juana credit their faith and a program for couples called Marriage Encounter for changing their attitudes and greatly improving their relationship. There was a, a huge banner in the, in the meeting room where we were at, and it says, love is a decision. And I think that's, that's part of it for us, that love is a daily decision. We could either love or not love, but it's up to me as the individual to look for it, to grasp it, and to hold it. It's not for me to depend on Juana to do it. I don't know that we can be in love every day of our lives, but I can certainly choose to love in spite of my being tired, in spite of my being disappointed, in spite of you know, my, my just being, I don't know, having a bad day at work or whatever. I can still be loving. The secret for, for a successful marriage is work. It's not a matter of luck. It's not a, it's not a matter of, um, uh, it's not magic. It's work, and it's giving, a lot of giving. Sometimes, you know, I hear people say that it's 50-50. I know it's not. It's, it's 100. Sometimes it's 100. Sometimes it's nothing. If, if I have very little or nothing to give, that's all I'm going to give today, and, and it's OK. But other times when I have plenty, I'll give, I'll give lots. So it's not, it's not a matter of measurement. It's just a matter of, um, I'm here for the duration, OK, whatever it takes. Emily and Ronald Hubbard have been married 42 years. Lasting this long as a couple has meant acceptance of each other's faults and adapting through many life changes. When we first got married, I thought we'd be really in love forever and ever, you know, not like these couples sitting at the table with nothing to say after 20 years. I also thought he was my knight in shining armor. I didn't realize he had a few habits I wasn't real fond of until later. There were things about the way that she did things that I didn't realize, didn't know, and I would say the first five years of our marriage were the toughest. I didn't realize that, uh, for instance, Emily had a temper, and I can remember we've been married about a year, and she taught me how to play 52 pickup. That's when she throws all the cards the full length of the trailer, and I have to pick them up, because she's mad because she loses a card game. I didn't know she had a temper. The Hubbard's marriage entered another challenging phase when they started having children. I think I was, uh, pretty much an absentee father. I did sort of what I had to do, what was expected of me. Uh, but uh, as Emily said, uh, I, we discovered I'm a workaholic. And uh, so I was at work a lot. And it wasn't until the two were born that she needed help and I recognized that. And at that point I did start to, to help more. But the, the children sure uh, put a lot of chaos in your marriage. No one knows they're going to have twins till you're in the process. And that does thicken the plot. I mean, you go from two to four, and it's double everything. For the first 25 years of their marriage, the Hubbards have managed through the good times and the bad times without much discussion about their feelings. 
I think I just it, it stuffed those feelings. I just went on and said, well, this must be the way it is. Uh, everybody must go through this, or maybe I'm going through a tougher time because everybody else seems happy. Must be me. And uh, so I stuffed a lot of those, uh, what I now recognize as feelings, because I wasn't raised to recognize feelings, you know, and, and so that was just the way it was. Things changed when the Hubbards learned about a program designed to enhance relationships called Marriage Encounters. We heard about Marriage Encounters through a little blurb in our friendly uh, newsletter from the, our church. And both of us, we knew nothing about it. We thought, hmm, well, it's supposed to be good for marriages. Let's look into it. We really were naive because we had no idea what it was about. But we rank it along with our wedding day and the births of our children that important in our lives. It's just a wonderful uh, situation for uh, couples to um, rediscover, really, the love that they've always had for each other and find out who that wonderful person is today that they married, that somehow, in, as the years have passed, they sort of lost track of who that person really was, you know? And it, gives, it gave me an opportunity to find out who, who I am at that point in time, you know? And it gave me communication tools to use after the weekend that's allowed us to stay in touch uh, much more effectively. So it's just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. When we were first married, we spent a lot of time talking to each other and with each other. But we were talking about facts and things that we thought. Uh, we were not talking about feelings. And I, invariably, about once a week, we would go to our bedroom and the kids knew not to knock on the door. And we would talk at length about what we thought. And finally, and this came through Marriage Encounter, we learned to talk about feelings. Because that was something that wasn't really done. Uh, where we were raised wasn't part of the norm. And once we learned to talk about feelings, and how something would cause us to feel or how we would feel in regard to something made a big difference. The light bulb came on. Emily and I are really the most important uh, thing other than God in our lives. And uh, in the end, we are the two that still must be united and together. We're more important than our children, uh, than activities and that sort of thing. And so now we take quality time together to work on our relationship. And the other thing is, we are always changing. I'm not the same person I was five years ago. And so we need to keep working at this relationship so that we're in touch and in tune with each other as we make those changes. Right. If God is a part of your marriage, it's a three-way marriage, it's not a two-way marriage. It's much stronger. It will survive. Robert and Ruth Bartholow have been married 52 years. I thought he was handsome and um, full of fun, you know, and liked to do different things and always had a good sense of humor. I like a good sense of humor. And uh, he just seemed to be compatible with me, which I hadn't experienced with other fellows I'd been out with. I can remember telling my mother very soon after I got to know Ruth that I think that I met the woman that I was gonna marry or that I wanted to marry. I don't think I had an entirely realistic view of marriage. I guess I expected marriage to be Love and kisses and romance all the uh, time you were married. I didn't think too far ahead that way. There were times when we didn't get along too well, and I, I had to myself work a little harder because who else am I going to get along with any better if I don't try with my own husband? I would think that uh, any couple that has a enriching spiritual life is probably going to be able to go through the hard times of, uh, of life and hard times of marriage much better than if you lack it. I think we need all the help we can get, uh, and God gives us help, He gives us strength to endure and, and see things through and work things through. Once in a while, a prayer for Lord will thank God that I was blessed with the companion and wife I've got, and I really mean that. One of the secrets of marriage, I think, of faith commitment gives you um, an added kind of strength and support that you don't have if you are not in that relationship with your God and that relationship with the, with the faith community. The Reverend Kathy Bowman is pastor of First Lutheran Church in Vista, California. She's been married for 22 years and has two children. The core of our relationship and our marriage has been our faith commitment. But it's real important for our kids to have not just our model of what marriage and faith is all about, but to also have the models of their extended family and their church family. I think as we look at 
maybe generations before us, they had a real commitment to um, being and staying married with each other through all that life would bring you and took very, very seriously those vows that were made till death do us part. Um, and there was just that understanding that we don't give up on each other. I went into marriage with a total 100% commitment till death do us part. I mean, that's what I promised to do. And that's the way I was raised and that's the way it was gonna be. I think we really have lost that somewhat in this generation. And it has become easier to um, break off those relationships and say, it is not worth it anymore. Many people today look at the high rate of failed marriages and wonder what they can do to prevent the same thing from happening to them. Are there any secrets to lasting marriages? Our couples provide a few more tips. We try to resolve conflicts as soon as they occur. Don't let them fester so that they don't become blown out of proportion. We try to remember that we are more important than the issue that is the conflict. Now that doesn't get rid of the conflict. We have to work it out. Now there's some rules for fighting that we've learned and one is no character assassination um, and stay to the subject and um, stay till the fight is finished. And don't enlarge the committee. And, and, and don't bring anyone else in. Make it between the two of yourselves. We are human and we make mistakes. And sometimes, sometimes we make big mistakes, okay? And we have hurt each other. And we have hurt each other deeply sometimes. And I think for me, knowing that, that I'm gonna be forgiven time and again and again uh, makes me feel kind of secure, uh, free also, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna blunder, I know that. And I don't have to worry, and I don't have to be fearful that now what is Joe gonna do to me? What is Joe gonna, is he gonna stop loving me? Is he gonna ask me to leave, you know? It's not a fear in me. I know that we'll work it through, and I know that in the end, he loves me enough to forgive me. Now I'm a firm believer that if you want your marriage to work, you have to associate and hang around with other good marriages that have the same values, the same ideas, the same dreams. Uh, that you have. I think the one thing for lasting marriage is good. Be honest with each other. Uh, don't be afraid to share, even if it's a uh, hurt that's so hurtful that you know you don't want to share it with anybody else. You know, but you've got to be able to share this with your spouse. Uh, and, and so I think that the, the good, honest communications are always a must. I would second that. It has to be a trusting, loving communication. And you can't bottle things up. You need to be able to be open and free uh, in speaking with your spouse. The level of, uh, of the romance is much deeper the older you get. But I don't think you should ever lose it. And I certainly don't think we've lost it. It's not your infatuation type of romance, but you, uh, you appreciate each, which, each other more, and you, you still have some sexual activity, but not as much. And uh, I still think of him as a young, young man yet. And <laughs> I think he's kind of cute. <laughs> I like to be with him. It's important to be lovers. And you know, when you're at newly introduced to each other, I mean, the, the steamy side of love, the sexual side, certainly is there. But you better be best friends, too. You better be able to talk to 3 o'clock in the morning. And, I mean, that's what part of the cement that keeps us together for now nearly 43 years and keeps making it fun and interesting. It's adventuresome. It's exciting. Marriage should be a lifelong partnership of love and fidelity. It's really no secret how to make it happen for you. Like most things in life, it requires commitment and sacrifice, things that can be hard to do consistently, but which are a lot easier when we rely on God for help.